surface anatomy of the vascular system. The subclavian arteries. The right subclavian artery emerges with the right common carotid from the short brachiocephalic trunk. The left subclavian artery starts directly from the arch of the aorta. It may be possible to palpate them as they travel over the first rib, posterior to the clavicle and posterior to the scalenus anterior muscle. It continues deep to the clavicle and then into the axilla, hence the change of name to axillary artery. The carotids. The right common carotid originates from the brachiocephalic trunk. The left arises from the arch of the aorta. Each vessel passes obliquely upwards from behind the sternoclavicular joint to the level of the upper border of the thyroid cartilage. There it divides into the internal and external carotids. The jugular veins. The internal jugular vein travels with the common carotid and vagus nerve inside the carotid sheath. It provides venous drainage for the contents of the cranium. The external jugular runs superficial to the external clitomastoid. The left and right external jugular veins drain into the subclavian veins. The axillary artery. The axillary artery may be palpated deep within the axilla. It is best to have the arm relaxed so that muscular tension does not mask the pulsations. Insert one or preferably two fingers superiorly and laterally against the lateral axillary border. The superficial temporal artery. The temporal artery emerges as the branch of the external carotid. The temporal artery can easily be palpated just anterior to the tragus of the ear or just posterior to the neck of the mandible. If the fingers are traced superiorly and slightly anteriorly, the superficial temporal artery can also be palpated over the temporalis muscle. The facial artery. This artery has an easy to palpate pulse. It is best felt as it passes over the ramus of the mandible, approximately midway between the mental tubicle and the angle of the mandible. The parotid glands. The superior border is at the level of the posterior two-thirds of the lower border of the zygomatic arch. The posterior border is in front of the external acoustic meatus, the mastoid process, and the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The inferior border is just below the angle of the mandible. The anterior border lies over the masseter. The salivary duct drains opposite the second upper molar tooth. The brachial artery. This is essentially a continuation of the axillary artery. The brachial artery descends the medial border of the arm. In the upper part it is located at the lower margins of the teres major, then anterior to the coracobrachialis and medial to the biceps muscle. The ulnar nerve lies superficial to the superior part of the brachial artery and then over the median nerve as it approaches the antecubital crease. It is at this point that the brachial artery is commonly auscultated when taking the blood pressure just before it goes deep to the bicipital aponeurosis. The 
the radial artery. The radial artery divides just distal to the antecubital crease to form the radial and ulnar arteries. At the wrist, the radial artery is easy to palpate, just anterior to the styloid process of the radius. The radial artery can again be palpated over the dorsal aspect of the hand within the anatomical snuff box as it lies over the lateral border of a scaphoid. The ulnar artery. Similarly, the ulnar artery can also be palpated at the wrist. This time, palpate distal to the ulnar styloid process over the pisiform. The pulsations are weaker, as this is a smaller artery, and also diminished by the palmar aponeurosis. The cephalic vein. The cephalic vein lies in the lateral aspect of the arm and forearm. It eventually joins onto the subclavian vein. Starting from the forearm, the cephalic vein can be traced in the lateral border, then near the head of the radius in the anterolateral aspect of the elbow. It then travels superiorly lateral to the biceps brachii then between the pectoralis major and deltoid muscles to become the subclavian vein. The basilic vein. The basilic vein can be traced in the medial aspect of the forearm as it ascends anterior to the medial condyle of the humerus. It continues medially in the arm until the axilla, when it becomes the brachial vein, then the axillary vein. The median cubital vein. The median cubital vein, or median basilic vein, is a superficial vein of the upper limb. It lies in the cubital fossa superficial to the bicipital aponeurosis. It connects the basilic and cephalic veins. It has an oblique course from lateral to medial. It is often used for venipuncture. The femoral artery. This can be palpated with ease, just inferior to the inguinal ligament, halfway between the anterior superior iliac spine and symphysis pubis. The femoral artery then travels deep within the muscles of the thigh, then medially and then posteriorly as it approaches the knee joint. At the distal one-third of the thigh, it travels through the adductor canal together with the femoral vein, the femoral nerve, the saphenous nerve, and the nerve to vastus medialis. The femoral artery emerges through the opening of the adductor magnus to travel into the popliteal fossa. The popliteal artery. The femoral artery has now become the popliteal artery. It can be palpated deep in the popliteal fossa, but not with ease. To reduce tension from the muscles and tendons, the relaxed knee should be placed at 45 degrees. To increase your chances of locating the popliteal artery, you may use the fingertips of both hands cupped around the condyles while supporting the weight of the leg. The anterior and posterior tibial arteries. Their origin is just below the popliteal crease between the two heads of the gastrocnemius muscle. The popliteal artery gives off three branches, first the anterior tibial, then the posterior tibial artery, and then the peroneal artery. The posterior tibial artery. 
The posterior tibial artery continues directly inferiorly deep to the gastrocnemius, soleus and plantaris muscles. Then it becomes superficial posterior to the medial malleolus. It then continues into the medial plantar aspect of the foot. At the ankle joint, the posterior tibial artery passes behind the medial malleolus. It is accompanied by the posterior tibial vein along its course. The posterior tibial artery can be palpated inferolateral to the medial malleolus. It is an important pulse in evaluating the vascular integrity of the lower extremities. The anterior tibial artery. After the bifurcation from the popliteal artery, it pierces the interosseous membrane to travel anteriorly between the tibia and fibula. This artery descends deep within the tibialis muscles in the anterior and slightly medial aspect of the leg. Over the foot it becomes the dorsalis pedis. This is also a clinically significant artery to palpate. This pulse can be located between the tendons of extensor digitorum longus and extensor hallucis longus between the first and second metatarsals. The great saphenous vein. This is a superficial vein in the anterior and medial aspect of the entire leg. It starts from the medial marginal vein at the dorsum of the foot. It ascends from the dorsal aspect of the foot, anterior to the medial malleolus, and the medial aspect of the calf muscle. Then behind the posterior medial condyle of the knee, and then the anterior medial aspect of the thigh. It pierces the saphenous opening, just inferior to the inguinal ligament, at the midpoint to join onto the femoral vein. The small saphenous vein. This is a relatively large superficial vein located in the posterior part of the leg. It starts from the lateral marginal vein of the dorsum of the foot. It ascends posterior and lateral to the lateral malleolus and slightly lateral to the calf muscles, then between the two heads of the gastrocnemius muscle. It then joins to the popliteal vein behind the knee. The popliteal vein then becomes the femoral vein as it ascends deep within the posteromedial muscles of the thigh. 